Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? If you're new, uh, my name is Mark, one of the pastors here on staff, and we are digging right in, wasting no time. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 1. If you don't, we have the free orange ones available for you underneath your chairs at page 682. Um, Okay, so week two, brand new series going through the Gospel of Mark. Technically, I guess we should say John Mark. That is the individual who wrote this in ancient Rome. And um, last week, here's what we saw as kind of the introduction. That John Mark, when he writes this biography of Jesus of Nazareth, he wants us to see that Jesus brought a new exodus, a new exodus. And uh, there's all these themes of going through water in the Exodus, that was the Red Sea. For Mark, it's the Jordan River. They're out in the desert, the wilderness, which is what Israel did when they left the Exodus to head to the promised land. And actually, all of these themes um, only even kind of heightened even more, starting at verse 9, which is what we are in this morning. And so, um, any first century Jew, and we looked at this last week, these stories, these images, these words, um, literally geographical locations stirred up this story of a new exodus. And so, here we are, verse 9. Here's where we pick up. At that time, Jesus, he came from Nazareth, and real quick, by the way, Nazareth um, was like... It was like, you did not want to come from Nazareth. It was not a well-known um, town, or it was well-known, but just for the wrong reasons. And so it's just fascinating that Jesus comes from there. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Now, I debated about literally doing this whole sermon just about that phrase being torn open, and I chose not to, but the Greek verb there for being torn, um, it doesn't mean open. It means like ripped apart, and it's fascinating because in chapter 15, the end of Mark, when Jesus is on the cross dying, the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. Such that a commentator, um, he he says, what is open may be closed, but what is ripped cannot easily return to its former state. Ladies and gentlemen, heaven is being ripped open in the person of Jesus. And so just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And we'll get to that. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Very, very bizarre scene. Um, you may have noticed in Mark's biography, he's, he's a little bit different than the other three, Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark is quick, he's to the point, he just starts things off, and he doesn't kind of really explain things. Um, but this is important to know. All four biographies that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four record Jesus' baptism for us. And check this out, more attention is paid to Jesus' baptism than his birth. And that's interesting to think about because we just came off of Christmas last month. Um, But did you know only two Gospels have the birth narrative? Matthew and Luke. Mark, um, and then John and 
John's kind of in his own world. Um, they, they say nothing about the birth of Jesus. So they're like, they're a little down on Christmas. Um, but another fascinating thing to realize is that for those who, who give us uh, recording Jesus' baptism, they always pair it with the temptation of Jesus. So the baptism of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus go together right away in three out of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all share the same story, and they do it right away. Um, And I want to submit to you this morning that that is not by mistake. Jesus' baptism and his temptation, we have to see them um, as together because they go together. And even grammatically, um, the Greek verb that links them is a very unique verb to Mark's biography. He uses it 47 times. And let me reread the sentence for you. Right after God tells Jesus, you are my son, whom I love, with you I'm well pleased, Mark then puts, and here it is, at once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. Uh, You could also translate at once as like immediately or quickly, right away, just then. There's something connecting these two, what appears to us, as very bizarre scenes. Jesus' baptism and his temptation. Um, Tim Keller, he's a retired pastor in New York City, big fan of his. Um, he, he points out that uh, it seems like there's a spiritual baptism and then a spiritual battle. There's a voice from heaven and then there's a voice from hell. There's water, then there's desert, there's refreshment, and then there's dryness. There's comfort and love, and then there's stress and conflict. And all immediately... Like, there's no time in between. It just goes straight, water, desert, refreshment, dryness, comfort, love, stress, conflict. Why is there this immediate contrast? That's what I want to ask this morning. So let's take these in order. First, Jesus' baptism, verses 9 through 11. Um, This is a divine scene in every sense of the word. Um, Jesus is beginning to be anointed and empowered for his ministry. He's being identified as God's chosen Messiah. A Messiah, it literally just means anointed one. Anointed one. And so this is like this majestic picture of the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, they are all working together in this scene in the river. And notice that a voice from heaven, um, which represents God the Father, is declared and says to God the Son, you are my Son with whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. God the Father is quoting from Psalm 2-7. Don't worry about turning there. It reads pretty much exactly as that quote reads. And Psalm 2-7 was a really, really, really well-known coronation passage, meaning when a king was installed, they read Psalm 2-7. And so God the Father is reading these words of of Psalm 2-7 over his son, Jesus. And he's saying, you are the chosen one. You are my son. Son of God was another title for Messiah back in the first century. And notice that the father says, I love you. Like with you, I am well pleased. Uh, He's saying, you're my beloved. Like I've I've chosen you. You are my purpose. Like I'm I'm giving you validation. Um, Your identity comes from me. You are loved. My, My love is marking you out. And you're going to do what Israel should have done, but couldn't. Previously in the Old Testament, Yahweh, God the Father, he would call Israel, the nation of Israel, he would call them his son. The problem is, though, if you know the story of the Old Testament, is that Israel, God's son, they they went astray. They never followed the Father's orders, if you will. And so here Jesus shows up, 
And the father says, you are my son, you are my chosen one. You're going to do what Israel should have done but failed to do as they went after other gods. And then this whole thing of like right before it, it says that a, uh, a dove <laughs> descends upon Jesus. Now, I'll just be honest, um, the first time when I read this as I started prepping last week, you read that like a dove descends upon um, Jesus, and my mind just went to like those dove men's shampoo commercials, you know, where like the guy comes out of the water and his like hair is like shining and glowing. Um, that's at least what my mind went to. This isn't a dove's men care shampoo commercial, though I do use dove men's care shampoo. Anyways, none of that is relevant. Um, all that to say is that is not what's going on in this passage. So explain to me, Mark, what is this whole dove thing? Great question. This is so cool. Like I've been waiting a couple days to share this with you. In the first century, um, the Old Testament was translated into Aramaic. It was originally in Hebrew. Um, and rabbis they translated it into Aramaic, and that translation was called the Targums. And you don't really need to remember all this. Here's what's fascinating, though. The Targums in the first century, here is how they quoted Genesis 1-2, which is a part of the creation story. It reads like this. And the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Ah, and here it is. And the Spirit of God fluttered above the face of the waters like a dove. And God spoke, let there be light. Genesis 1-2, Aramaic translation, says the Spirit is like a dove in God's act of creation. Um, Tim Keller then says this, there are three parties active in the creation of the world. God, God's Spirit, and God's Word through which He creates. The same three parties are present at Jesus' baptism. The Father who's the voice, the Son who's the Word, and the Spirit fluttering like a dove. Mark is deliberately pointing us back to the creation, to the very beginning of history, just as the original creation of the world was a project of the triune God, so the redemption of the world, the rescue and renewal of all things, is beginning now with the arrival of the king and is a project of the triune God. And check this out. When Jesus comes out of the water, the Father envelops him and covers him with words of love. Meanwhile, the Spirit covers him with power. Jesus, God's chosen son, is anointed with two things, love and power. In other words, identity and spirit, who he is and the means to carry that identity out. Now, at this point, Jesus is 30 years old. Luke tells that um, to us in his biography. Has Jesus' ministry started yet? No. Or at least from what we have recorded. This scene is literally the launching pad, the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. Technically, it starts in verse 14, which we're going to look at next Sunday. But this is the very start, meaning this. Has Jesus done one miracle yet, to our knowledge? No. Has he cast out one demon? No. Has he done one healing? No. Has he preached the gospel yet? No. Does he have any followers yet? No. Has he done any public teaching yet? No. Jesus hasn't done anything. It's the very beginning, and he is told that he is loved and filled with power. Isn't that interesting? Before he's done anything, the Father says, here's your identity, and you are loved. And the Spirit descends upon him empowering him, love and power, identity and ability, presence and power, the Father, the Spirit, with the Son. This is an earth-shattering event that changes history immediately. 
You see the awkwardness of that? Law of power immediately, quickly, just then. Therefore, Jesus is sent into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by Satan with a bunch of wild animals, whatever the heck that means. What? Here's what I need you to see this morning. When the love and power of God descend upon someone, much less the Messiah, the Son of God, a battle is bound to ensue. Get your armor out. Remember Keller? A spiritual baptism is followed by a spiritual battle. Christianity, brothers and sisters, is a fight. Following Jesus is a battle. And I can't say that enough because I think we have this inclination for the American church. We do and say anything we can to get someone to accept Jesus and we make it sound like a picnic in the park. No. Actually, biblically, Jesus says stuff like, hey, if you want to follow me, like, why don't you come pick up your cross? Like, what if we did that at altar calls? Hey, if you want to, if you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, can, like, can we just tell you that your life's going to be really tough? Okay, now come forward, please. I mean, this scene in Mark is the first conflict, and what it does is it sets the stage for the rest of the biography, showing us that there is a cosmic battle going on between the Son and the forces of Satan. And Jesus is starting to wage war. And actually, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament. So did you wonder why, like, why is Mark so particular to mention that he's in the wilderness for 40 days? Why not 38 days? Why not 55 days? Why not three days? I mean, why 40? Here's why. In the Old Testament, Moses received a divine calling from Yahweh. He receives the Ten Commandments. I make this joke all the time, but that's Charlton Heston right there, okay? He receives the Ten Commandments, and what happens next? Forty days, forty nights, without food and water. Fast forward a little bit. Elijah, well-known prophet. We talked about last week, John the Baptist kind of mimics Elijah. What happens to Elijah? Elijah's where? Guess. A desert for how long? Yeah, okay, we are alive this morning. <laughs> Try one more. So you got Moses, Elijah, 40 days, desert. The nation of Israel wanders where? Where do they wander? In the desert, the wilderness, for how long? 40 years. <laughs> they, they wish it was 40 days. <laughs> it was a long time. So there's all these stories in the Old Testament of these struggles of when people have a divine calling, Moses, Elijah, and certainly Israel, and they wander for 40 days or 40 years in the desert after a divine call. And they all struggle. They all mess up in some capacity. What Jesus is doing here, and any first century Jewish person would have picked this up, Jesus is ushered into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by Satan to do what Israel should have done but couldn't, to do what you and I should have done but can't. Jesus will be victorious over Satan and win the battle, and it's starting now. Now, to take this one step further, if, if you're a nerd like I am, actually, I think this is the story of creation and how it all began, because guess what happens in Genesis 2? Adam and Eve receive a divine calling, fruitful, multiply, extend Eden out to the rest of the earth. And what happens after they receive that divine calling? Satan shows up. What does Satan do? Tempts them. And what do they do? So you see this. Divine calling, battle, tempted, eh, failure. Jesus shows up, 
and is the true human who goes out to battle in the desert without food and water and is going to kick some booty with Satan. That is what's going on here. This is why battle language matters. This is why Christianity is a fight. This is why following Jesus is a battle. It's a clashing of kingdoms. The kingdom of God, which was Jesus' main language, versus the kingdom of Satan, light into darkness. It is a war. It is a battle. Now, I would venture to think that most of us, when we read this passage, and you saw the word Satan, if you're like me, what your mind goes to is like the little red devil with horns and a pitchfork, you know, on one of your shoulders talking to the angel on the other shoulder, right? That is our understanding of Satan. Um, or maybe you're here, and this is why Alpha is, sorry, we love Alpha so much because it welcomes people with questions. Maybe you're kind of like, man, this whole Satan thing, like that is a pre-modern, pre-scientific, outdated myth. Spiritual beings, come on, Mark. That, that's, we know Satan doesn't exist today. Two things. One, if you're at least willing to entertain the possibility of God, that there's a higher being who's personal, most people's understanding of God is that he's good. If you're willing to believe in that, or at least entertain it, it is philosophically completely logical than to at least entertain the possibility that there is a spiritual higher being who's evil. If you're willing to accept that there's a God, there's no, it's not illogical to believe then that something like Satan exists. I'm not saying that that means he does. I'm just saying it leaves open the possibility. Second thing, I think this is at least the one that does it for me. I think it's very, very, very hard to explain rationally evil and darkness unless something like Satan exists. I think it's very hard rationally to explain something like the Holocaust unless there is literally something demonic like driving it. Are humans evil? Absolutely. And was there human evil in the Holocaust? Absolutely. But it at least seems to me that it actually makes more sense philosophically to think that there's something even behind that driving such horrific events all throughout history reality, life itself, and I think we know this in our bones, is a cosmic battle. And we are fighting actually a very smart, personal evil being called Satan. I actually think Satan probably has better theology than many of us in this room. We're going to look at that actually in, in the demonic interactions that Jesus has with them. They know who Jesus is. Demons and Satan know far more about Jesus than most Americans. That's a whole other topic. But Satan means the adversary, the accuser, the father of lies. And so Jesus, as he goes to launch his ministry, he has to take on Satan. You ever have one of those moments, um, we call them God moments or something, where like God just does something remarkable in your life, like literally changes your life for the good. And then like a couple days later, a couple weeks, something bad happens to you and it throws you off and it tries to distract and disrupt that good thing that God just did. Let me give you an example. Um, years ago, I did youth ministry. This is like classic youth ministry. Kids go off to summer camp or winter camp. They give their lives to Jesus. They have this what's called, you know, a mountain high experience. And they come back down the hill, so to speak. And then like something happens that week to them. 
something bad happens to disrupt and to get them to believe that what happened there wasn't really real. What's happening now to them is more real and it destroys the faith building that had just happened to them. I think this happens actually quite a bit. I even know for me, the last three years as being a lead pastor, right, which is supposedly like a holy God-ordained calling, I couldn't tell you how many times I am tempted daily to believe lies um, where I feel like I'm being attacked by Satan or stuff has come up against my family or in my marriage or with my kids and I just want to give up. It's not worth it. It's too much battle for me. Like I don't want to, it's, it's just not worth it. And I don't say that to play the victim card as much as I say that to say that life is a battle. The more you follow Jesus, the more the battle increases. The more you follow Jesus, the more the battle increases. We don't like to talk warfare. We we get scared of talking about Satan and demons and all this other stuff, and we'll dive in more into that. But I I just have to say this morning that that is front and center in Jesus' ministry. Like, there's no way of getting around that. Here comes the inevitable question. If Jesus received the power and love of God to start his ministry, if the Father proclaimed his identity over Jesus and secured him in the love of who, he, of who God says he is, if the Spirit descended upon him to give him power, it, like, if that was true of Jesus, like if Jesus, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, received his identity and his power from the Father and the Spirit, how much more should we? Like, if that was true of Jesus as he went into ministry, what in the world would make us think that we don't need the same thing? If it was true for Jesus, I think that it should certainly be true for us. You and I this morning, brothers and sisters, if you claim to follow Jesus, you have to continually know that the Father loves you, that he's pleased with you, that you can rest assured when all the temptations and all the lies come to you, that you can know that your identity is in God alone and not what culture says. But that is a battle. For you and and I to do this life as followers of Jesus, like not only do you need to know what your identity and that you are secure in his love, the other thing is you got to have some power because we are weak and we cannot do this life alone. We just simply don't have enough. Here's the good news of Jesus Christ this morning. If you see, if you follow Jesus, the Father sees you as he sees Jesus. If you follow Jesus, God the Father sees you the same way that he sees God the Son. That is actually why Jesus died on the cross for you and was resurrected. Because the Father wants to see you in Jesus. Just as he sees Jesus, he sees you. And this phrase, in Jesus, I mean, it's very conceptual, uh, but it's actually all over the New Testament. And so the Apostle Paul, when he goes to plant churches all throughout the ancient world, the content of his letters, so much of it uses this phrase, in Christ, in Jesus. Like he has to belabor to them, hey, You are defined by who you are in Jesus. Nothing else defines you. You have to understand yourself as being in Jesus. Let me give you an example. Ephesians 1 is the best thing for this. I'm just going to read this real quick, but I want you to hear the rhythm of it. Verse 3, Ephesians 1, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing In Christ, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
in love, He predestined us to adoption, to sonship, through or in Jesus Christ. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Verse 11, in Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Paul, he just can't get enough. Verse 13, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So if you're a follower of Christ and you don't believe that The Father sees you as He sees the Son. Just read Ephesians 1 every morning. Paul just goes to town on saying, you are in Him. A brilliant um, New Testament scholar who's shaped so much of my theology, N.T. Wright, he says this best. The whole Christian gospel could be summed up in this point. That when the living God looks at us, at every baptized and believing Christian, He says to us what he said to Jesus on that day. He sees us not as we are in ourselves, but as we are in Jesus Christ. And when we do this, we will be equipped as Jesus was to be sent out into the desert. And I think this next part probably resonates with a lot of us. If we start the journey imagining that our God is a bully, an angry, threatening parent ready to yell at us, slam the door on us, or kick us out into the street because we quite haven't made the grade. We will fail at the first whisper of temptation. But if we remember the voice that speaks those powerful words of love, we will find a way through. Brothers and sisters, do you hear the voice of the Father who says that in Jesus, He loves you. You're His beloved. Like He's well pleased with you. So two questions for you this morning. The first is this. Do you go to your heavenly Father for your identity? Who or where do you go to to find love, to find security, to find worth? Do you listen to God's voice over you or do you look to your spouse, your kids, your job, your financial accomplishments? Your body image, your social media account, how many likes, comments, and followers you have. I mean, I think we're in an identity crisis, at least for Gen Z with social media. And it's because we go to other things to find our love, identity, and security and worth rather than listening to the Father's voice. It is impossible to be human and not look for an identity, security, and purpose. The question is, to whom are you going to for that? Is it your heavenly Father, or are you going to listen to the lies of culture? And by the way, Satan is called the father of lies. Perhaps the biggest battle is believing what's ultimately true of you. I think this is so pertinent. Um, Now in 2022, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, articles I've read in the last two weeks, people are exhausted, and in particular, people who are in leadership. Just flat out exhausted. Like the last two years... Now, they sucked. Like, a lot, if you're in leadership, if you're an educator, a first responder, a health person, a pastor, a parent, 
Like you're in a lose-lose situation in the last two years. You're going to offend someone. You can't please everyone. We need, and our, our culture is so hungry for a divine love that secures you and cements you and what your identity is in the Father and not what culture says. We need an identity and a security that doesn't go with like whoever's, you know, their criticism, complaints, political views. Honestly, I'll say this, their own insecurities, whether or not you should wear a mask, who you vote for, what news station you listen to. If you listen and you are defined by uh, other people's identity of you, you will be a wreck. You'll be a wreck. You will be exhausted. Your love from others is only as good as their next criticism. Your kid's next tantrum, your job's next failed project, the um, volatility of the stock market. People pleasing is a deep spiritual issue. The temptation is to believe that those things will give you the love and security that you need, but guess what? They won't. They'll actually take you deeper into the wilderness. The problem with people pleasing, and I am a, I struggle, this is like one of my largest struggles. I struggle with people pleasing. The problem with it is that you go to find your worth, identity, and security in other people rather than the God who sees you in Jesus Christ. Second thing, it is because of that temptation to believe lies that not only does Jesus offer you a secure identity, but check this out. He offers you the Holy Spirit to give you the power and the victory to go into the wilderness, face those lies, and come out victorious. The way that you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, that, and I love this depiction, a gentle, calm dove. Like, who doesn't want a gentle, calm dove? That's why we release doves at weddings and funerals and all that. The way that you receive the power of the Holy Spirit is the same way that your car gets gas, although that is expensive now, and the way that your iPhone charges, you got to plug it into power. I think sometimes we read the Bible and we don't, okay, why don't I see those things? Why don't I see miracles? Yeah, because I don't know if we're plugged into the Holy Spirit like they were. The more time you spend with God in the scriptures and meditation and prayer and silence and solitude and intense things like fasting or giving, you will be empowered. You will be connected to the power source that allows you to go through testing in the desert and come out victorious. And so my question and my begging for you and I as a church is this, are we plugged in to the Spirit of God? We will go through a desert. But are we plugged in to the Spirit of God? Do you know that every miracle, every healing, every demon cast out that Jesus did when he multiplied the food, it was because the Spirit was on him and he was anointed. He did that out of his humanity, empowered by the Spirit. He gave up his prerogative to divinity, Philippians 2. If Jesus needed the Spirit of God, how much more? Do we? I want to invite the band back up. As they come up and we go into a time of response, I just want to invite you to close your eyes. Use this as a time to relax. Picture a calm dove resting on you. And here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read a sentence for you, and I want you to hear this statement. I also actually would love for you to whisper it under your breath, and I want you to insert your name in the front. Here's, here's the sentence. You are my dear, dear child. I am delighted with you. It's the Father. I just insert your name in that for me. Mark, I'm a dear, dear child of God. God's delighted with me. What's your name? Whatever your name is, Mark, I'm a dear, dear child. 
the Father's delighted with me. Just keep saying that to yourself. Speak the Father's identity over you. I'm going to ask for some prayer team, shepherding elders, to come forward. Stand up here for prayer. If you're here this morning, where, what are you tempted to believe about your identity that's not from the Father? What lies are you believing? What battle are you in? Where does the Spirit of God need to come in and shift your identity? What is that for you? Can you just come forward for prayer? It's safe, no judgment, no questions. We believe that the Spirit of God falls on people today. Praise God for that. Come, Holy Spirit.